let's go ahead and have um, Peter Mestach from um, the University of Ghent and the Cancer Research Institute of Ghent talk about the human, R human biofluid RNA atlas. It's a little bit early, but that gives him a couple extra minutes to, uh, to talk about that resource. Um, Peter? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep, and we can see your slides. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. So um, I will be talking about another uh, type of atlas. It's not as extensive as the one we just heard about. Uh, it's really just scratching the surface um, of um, um, other biofluids that were not uh, that are not being studied that extensively today. Uh, so we call that project the Human Biofluid RNA Atlas. It's been published, so I will not uh, talk about uh, too many of the methodological details and, and wet, wet lab workflows, uh, but that mainly uh, discuss a few uh, challenges um, we face and are still facing with respect to uh, the analysis of this this type of data. So. Um, just to uh, to kick off here and, and to give some background information for those that are not familiar with this uh, with this project or, or data set. So um, the goal was really to try to expand uh, the liquid biopsy field beyond uh, the bloodstream and beyond the more classical uh, uh, types of biofluids that are currently being studied, like plasma, serum, urine, and saliva. So we actually collected up to twenty different uh, biofluid samples, uh, twenty different types of biofluids. Uh, from uh, various individuals, limited in scope in terms of the number of individuals that contributed, uh, but uh, a relatively broad in scope with respect to the number of different uh, biofluid types. And so uh, these uh, biofluids are actually analyzed using two complementary RNA sequencing procedures. One is small RNA sequencing, I will not talk about small RNA sequencing data today, just uh, refer to the, to the manuscript if you want to know more. Uh, the other is uh, mRNA capture sequencing. And so mRNA capture sequencing, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the data you get from that. So basically you're using biotinylated probes to capture uh, protein coding exons. And as a, let's say, as a, as an, as a dessert on top of, of the messenger RNAs, you also get circular RNAs. And I'll be talking uh, at the near the end of the presentation very briefly about uh, circle RNAs and some of the challenges. Um, another thing I just want to briefly mention here, mainly for the experimentalists, uh, but also uh, I think for, for data analysts. Um, so what we uh, managed to do is basically introduce synthetic spike in RNAs um, during various steps in the workflow, uh, both for small RNAs and long RNAs. And uh, those have actually uh, opened up a number of uh, specific analysis that we could do with this data, uh, especially comparing these uh, highly divergent uh, biofluids and, and comparing the RNA content between uh, highly divergent uh, RNA, RNA biofluids. I don't have time to go into too much detail here, but so basically spikes were added to the fluid itself, but also to the RNA elowit. And then there's various calculations that you can do that can actually reveal um, information either on the concentration of uh, your uh, RNA in, in the fluid itself, the concentration of the RNA in the elowit, uh, information on RNA extraction efficiency and so on and, and so forth. And, and so uh, one of the things that, that became very clear when uh, looking at the relative RNA concentration across these fluids is that we observed highly variable uh, levels and, uh, of, uh, of RNA among these different fluids. And it, what was intriguing for us to see is that uh, when looking at the classic fluids like, like plasma or serum or urine, uh, we actually noticed that, that some of the other fluids that uh, we had not analyzed before or even thought of uh, analyzing before actually contained uh, quite a bit more uh, RNA, uh, sometimes 10, 100, or even up to a thousand times uh, more RNA in, in samples like human tears, seminal plasma, colostrum bile fluid, and so on, pancreatic kist fluid, uh, a, a lot more RNA than, than in the more classic biofluid samples, I would say, that are currently being studied, like urine uh, or platelet-free plasma. So that was interesting to see. Um, and um, the, the two things I want to touch upon today uh, basically are, um, um, I think a question many of us uh, are asking, and it was already uh, addressed uh, in part also in the first talk by Rob Kitchen. What, what is the origin of these extracellular RNAs? Uh, 
that we are detecting across these different fluids. Um, so I will mainly be talking about uh, some of the challenges in that field and uh, then briefly touch on uh, circle RNA quantification as well. So uh, again, this is something uh, that uh, Rob also brought forward in his presentation, so we won't spend too much time uh, discussing it here, but so one of the uh, uh, one of the computational approaches one can use to try to understand uh, the complexity and the origin of RNAs in a, in a complex mixture is computational deconvolution. And so what computational deconvolution basically does, it takes two, two types of data sets as input. Uh, on one hand, uh, there is marker genes or signature genes uh, for different cell types or tissues that you want to evaluate. And then on the other hand, there's of course the uh, complex bulk RNA-seq profile in, in our case, uh, bulk RNA-seq data from, from a biofluid. And what a computational algorithm can do is actually um, define or determine the fractional contribution of each of the tissues in your signature matrix to the complex uh, mixture in the, in the fluid. Now, um, we've reviewed, uh, uh, Francisco Avila Cobos, a postdoc in my lab, actually reviewed uh, a lot of these uh, computational deconvolution algorithms uh, very extensively uh, a few years ago, was published in bioinformatics. Uh, but uh, more importantly, what he uh, uh, a couple of years ago started doing was to try to understand which method we should use. And um, I want to talk about this uh, just a little bit because it has some very important uh, implications uh, when applying computational deconvolution to study uh, uh, um, uh, extracellular RNAs and, and biofluids. So um, there's, there's literally dozens of computational deconvolution algorithms out there. And, and for us, when, when starting to apply these in our research, it was very uh, difficult to understand uh, which one should we use in which, in which context, how should we normalize our data, what is the impact of normalization on the performance of these deconvolution methods, and so on and so forth. So what Francisco did is he took various single cell RNA sequencing data sets and uh, using those data sets, uh, he constructed uh, what is called the signature matrix or matrix C, where you have markers for each of the cell types. And then on, on the other half of the data, or using the other half of the data, he collected what we call pseudo bulk, bulk mixtures, where you're just um, combining single cell RNA sequencing data into pseudo bulk mixtures with no um, known cell type proportions. And then applied uh, a number of different, uh, uh, or, uh, or evaluated a number of different data analysis parameters like data transformation, scaling, normalization, and uh, uh, 20, up to 20, if I'm not mistaken, different um, uh, deconvolution methods, they're not all mentioned here, to assess uh, the, the expected versus the observed uh, proportions and then evaluated performance by calculating like a Pearson correlation or, a, or an error. And uh, I just want to highlight a few things here because uh, these things definitely have an impact on how we use computational deconvolution and, and, and how we should interpret results from computational deconvolution. So what this plot is showing you right here on the left, and again, all of this is published, so uh, I won't spend too much time and I just give you the highlights. Uh, these are various methods right here. Um, these are different normalization procedures, and what you can see here is the performance of the methods in combination with a certain normalization procedure. Uh, highlighted, uh, the color coding is showing the Pearson correlation coefficient, and the size of the dots uh, is showing uh, the error. So the larger the dots and the darker the color, the better the method is performing or the better the method is performing in combination with a certain normalization strategy. And so what you can immediately see here is that there's large differences in performance between these methods. So some work way better than others, at least based on the analysis that we have done. Um, and secondly, um, there's also an impact of the type of normalization procedure that you're applying. And this is also shown here, for instance, two different data sets. So every row is a data set. Every column is a normalization procedure, and this is for a single computational deconvolution uh, procedure called an NLS. And so what is plotted here are the observed proportions uh, versus the expected proportions in pseudo bulk mixtures. And so you can immediately see the dramatic impact uh, a normalization or choice of normalization method can have on the performance of, uh, of a deconvolution procedure. So even methods that deconvolution methods that work really well um, should be combined with proper normalization strategies. Because in this case, for instance, a quantile normalization has a dramatic impact on the performance of this algorithm. Basically, the performance is, is, is pretty bad. Uh, you cannot even say that it's performing. Uh, whereas a TMN normalization, for instance, here 
is uh, resulting in in the expected uh, in the expected proportions or is is uh, giving the expected proportions. So that's one thing. Um, more importantly, even for um, research into uh, liquid biopsies, is um, the impact of uh, the completeness of your signature matrix. So. Um, Francisco tried to simulate this. Uh, this is in a PBMC data set, again, making pseudo bulk mixtures. And um, in, what you can see here in the first column is the performance of uh, a, a single deconvolution method, like a, a one that works really well with an organization strategy that works really well. Um, and what is plotted is the error. And so you can see this is uh, the, the, the baseline performance of, of the methods in this PBMC data set. Uh, errors are relatively low for the various sample types and uh, the proportions that are estimated for the various sample types. And then he started removing uh, cell types from his signature matrix to evaluate what is the impact if your signature matrix is not complete, what is the impact on the deconvolution accuracy? And so you can see, for instance, here, this is what happens when you remove the CD14 positive monocytes from the signature matrix. This is what happens to the error on the other cell types. And so what you can see across all of the cell types, and no, ma no matter which cell type you, re you remove from your signature matrix, um, it, of course, all has an impact on the accuracy of the deconvolution results for the other cell types. And of course, this is very easily explained by the fact that uh, many of these algorithms or most of these algorithms have this sum to one constraint uh, where, where the, the, the sum of all fractions uh, should, be, should be one or 100%. So if you remove a cell type from your signature matrix, that means that the signal that is uh, uh, present, uh, the signal from that cell time that is present in your mixture will be distributed across the other cell types, resulting in false uh, estimations of cell type proportions. And I think that's a very interesting and very important concept. And by the way, we see this across different methods. Eh? This is NLLS, this is cyber source, so it's in, irrespective of the method that you're using. But I think what this is telling us is that um, it's really crucial to have a complete signature matrix. And so if you're doing computational deconvolution of tissue samples, you either use a, a book on anatomy or you do single cell RNA sequencing on the tissue to understand what are the cell types that are uh, present in that tissue. And you can make sure that your signature matrix is complete. You know that you need to have those cell types represented. If we're thinking about biofluids, I think it's, it's a, uh, the, the concept is, is more, more complex because it's much harder to determine upfront what are the cell types and tissues that will be contributing RNA to your biofluids, especially for some biofluids like plasma or serum, for instance, it could be any tissue. So to understand in our human biofluid atlas, uh, um, which tissues or cell types were really contributing, we, um, we took a slightly different approach for now because I mean, we're still chewing on this, this deconvolution problem. Um, so what we did here was a very simple and straightforward approach. Uh, we again used, we used markers for certain cell types and tissues shown in the, in the x-axis here, and basically just simply calculated fold changes for each gene between the selected biofluid and the median of all the other biofluids in our atlas. And uh, what that allowed us to do was to reveal biofluids where a certain tissue would contribute more RNA than that tissue would do to another biofluid. And so this is just one example here. This is for gastric fluid. If you look at the fold changes of the signature genes for all of these uh, um, tissues right here, you can basically see that tissues like esophagus, stomach, and colon are very strongly enriched in this uh, gastric fluid or show very highly positive fold changes in gastric fluid compared to other tissues, which kind of makes sense, right? Um, so that allows us to really put together a, a map of these fold changes to try to uh, understand whether uh, tissue contribution to these different fluids actually made sense. And, and it appeared to do so. Uh, we look, for instance, at prostate. We see prostate is mainly contributing to urine, to seminal plasma. Uh, if we look at, at stomach, for instance, stomach is mainly contributing to gastric fluid and so on. I won't go through the entire table. Uh, pancreas, for instance, is mainly contributing to pancreatic kist fluid. I think pancreatic kist fluid is a nice example of a fluid where um, it's, it's much easier to say uh, what are the tissues that are contributing or the cell types that are contributing. It's, it's probably going to be pancreas. Um, and so what we try to do here is really then to uh, apply computational deconvolution to pancreatic kist fluid, assuming that the majority of the RNA that would be contributed to that uh, fluid would come from pancreas. And so using single cell RNA sequencing data from um, 
from pancreas, uh, we defined marker genes for the different pancreatic cell types and then applied computational deconvolution on pancreatic case fluid, uh, allowing us to establish uh, the fractions of each of these cell types and how they, the fractional contribution of each of these cell types to the pancreatic case fluid uh, RNA profile. Um, and uh, without going into uh, too much depth here, because we only have two samples here, and this requires uh, much more extensive research, but, but the differences that we saw between those two samples, two patient samples, uh, kind of made sense in the, in the context of their, their diagnosis as well. Um, the last thing, and then that's just a, a, two, two more slides uh, I want to briefly discuss is um, challenges related to quantifying circular RNAs and, and especially quantifying circular RNA fractions. So by doing uh, RNA capture sequencing, we basically get coverage on linear RNAs, but we're also capturing, uh, potentially capturing uh, circular RNAs if they would be present, because circular RNAs are just made of the same exon sequences as a messenger RNA, so probes will bind there as well. Now, the challenge, first challenge is, of course, quantifying circular RNAs is something that uh, you can only do by uh, uh, looking at reads that span the backsplice junction. And so that's the only type of reads that are really specific for a circular RNA. But if you want to quantify circular RNA fraction, eh, what is the level of output, the linear and the circular RNA output per um, uh, per locus, and how does that differ between tissues and fluids? In order to do so, you need to have like something that is equivalent to a backsplice junction uh, for uh, the linear uh, the linear counterpart. And so um, this is not rocket science, but uh, um, it j just yeah, took a while to, to figure it out because uh, these, these, the coverage plots on these things can sometimes be very complex. Um, so so we, we put out a, a, a script that on, on GitHub that, uh, that actually takes care of, of this problem. And so basically what it comes down to is that the equivalent of, of a backsplice junction, there's a backsplice junction shown here in blue, for instance, the equivalent is a linear junction. Um, and so you can you need to define which linear junctions are truly linear, which ones are really ambiguous and, and could be derived from both the circle and the linear. So, so the, the uh, orange ones here are clearly ambiguous. Eh? You cannot basically say for sure whether uh, these are coming from the circle or coming from the linear uh, uh, isoform. Uh, whereas like the flanking junction reads or uh, non-flanking linear junction reads are clearly linear. And so if you do some normalization for the number of junctions that you take into account, you can basically calculate uh, the circle RNA fraction and compare fractions between fluids and tissues. And so when doing that in, in our biofluid atlas, it was actually pretty interesting to see that um, the median circular RNA fraction in fluids was way higher than, than what we saw in the tissues. And I think, again, this is something that we're only scratching the surface here, it requires much more work and investigation. Um, but basically, um, uh, it, it kind of aligns with, with the hypotheses that are being put forward in the circular RNA field, that circular RNAs are, let's say, more resistant to, to degradation by exonucleases and may therefore be more abundant compared to their linear counterparts in fluids than they are in tissues. Having said that, just one side note, an important one is that even with RNA capture sequencing, um, if you want to quantify circles, you're still limited to that backsplice junction. And so the number of reads mapping to such a backsplice junction still uh, is, is quite, uh, quite low. So I think more dedicated technologies are required. So with that, I'm not sure on time, but I hope I uh, uh, are more or less within time. I want to thank a few people. So uh, the work has uh, uh, on the Biofluid Atlas has, made, has been done by, by Eva Hellstart and uh, Francisco and Annaline uh, worked on the computation deconvolution and uh, the circle RNA quantification respectively, uh, of which I also shared uh, the references.